uh, with that, let's stand. And we're going to start our time of worship today with actually reading the memory verse. The memory verse. Uh, we could all just recite it, right? But we don't want to just uh, mindlessly recite something. So it's there in the bulletin. It's taken from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And let's read God's word to him in way of worship. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let us pray. Father, thank you for time together this morning. Thank you for health and strength. Thank you for a desire to want to worship you. And now may our worship be found pleasing to you. Uh, Spirit of God, you're the one who gives us new birth. You're the one who comes to dwell within and uh, through your power, you move our spirit to want to worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, may our worship be pleasing. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God from...
May all my days bring glory to your name. It's singing of the rock and my redeemer. A prayer that I often pray. I can't tell you it's every time. And it usually gets prayed here from someone on the team. But generally before, typically before I come up to preach. It's the words from verse 14 of Psalm 19. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength. And my Redeemer, my rock, and my Redeemer. Uh, we just missed out on a great song. We, we, we heard a great song. We were picking up on it a little bit. Uh, I don't have complete sway on the worship team, but perhaps if the system's working and we have the lyrics up on the screen next week, perhaps we could do that song again. How many of you would be in favor? That's enough. I saw one hand. 
Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians note there. We'll, we'll pray about that. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. In, in looking at this, I thought, you know, I could go a month in chapter 5, and I could probably go a month in chapter 6, but we're not going to do that. Uh, we are going to use this Sunday. This Sunday, we'll finish up the series, the series of How Then Shall We Walk, Christians in a non Christian world. I hope it's been helpful. I, whether you enjoy it or not doesn't really matter to me, and I don't mean that ignorantly or, or not ignorantly. That would not be the word. I don't mean that rudely. Uh, my job is to equip you. That's what a pastor teacher does, according to Ephesians chapter 4. I, I'm equipping the saints. I'm equipping you folks to go out and do ministry. And so whether you like something or not, doesn't really matter whether it's helpful in building you up and edifying that does matter and so i pray that our studies in the matter of how then shall we walk christians in a non-christian world uh starting out of uh the sermon on the mount matthew chapter 5 6 and 7 and then moving over to ephesians and seeing from paul's letter to the church of ephesus how many things that uh, uh the truths that jesus taught on the sermon on the mount we see once again in Ephesians. And so I hope it's been helpful to you. And today we're going to focus on this matter of walking carefully and walking wisely. So just verses 15 down to verse 21. If you will, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 down to verse 21. Ephesians 5. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Let us pray. Father, thank you to be able to call you Father. Thank you for the miraculous work of new birth, taking us from being dead in our trespasses and sins and making us alive. Thank you, blessed Spirit, for that work. Father, thank you that your spirit comes to dwell within, seals us onto the day of redemption, strengthening us, empowering us, enabling us, giving that, us that new disposition, that new desire to worship you, Father. And Father, we thank you for Jesus, the one who loves us and washed us of our sins in his own blood, our only mediator, our only hope, the one who gave his life that we may have life. It's in it's him, Lord, that we want to make big of today. It's, it's him because it's through him that we have access to you. Your word says, he said, as he ministered on this earth, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to you, Father, but by him. And so, Father, I, I pray that as we, uh, as we look at your word today, blessed spirit, give us understanding of it. Help us to uh, not only understand, but help us to apply. May your word uh, minister to our entire inner being, our, our mind, our will, our, our emotions. And may we live for the big idea. May we live, Father, in your presence, for your glory, for your honor. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I don't know if you were one of these type of kids uh, growing up that always heard the admonishment of be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful, whatever you do, be careful. How many of you heard those words growing up? I heard them from parents. I heard them from grandparents. In fact, probably one of the last things my nanny Schultz told me a uh, few years ago as I was leaving Ebensburg was, you be careful, Scotty, and you call me when you get back, right? And it's funny because then we end up growing up with hearing that, that we start telling our 
children that as well. And even clear into their adult years, we're still telling our children to be careful. Now, our concern for them is their their physical well-being for the most part, that they would get from point A to point B safely and everything would be okay. Well, Paul means much more that than that when he says to be careful. And I want us to understand his words here when he says in the King, New King James, walk circumspectly. How many of you used that in a sentence this past week? Nobody? But we did say be careful, right? And, and we do want people, uh, we want fellow brothers and sisters to walk carefully, to walk wisely. And we'll, we'll explain all that here in just a little bit. But when we come to this admonishment, when we come to verse 15 and it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And we won't go there yet on the PowerPoint. We have to look back. Because to say, see then, why is the then there? It's similar to the therefore and the wherefore. It takes our thinking back. What did he say previously that he would now say, see then, or because of? Well, we need to look at that. And we could go back, 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 clear to Ephesians chapter 1. We're not going to do that. We understand that the first three chapters of, a, of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus was about what they had in Christ. Because of all that God is and all that we are in Christ and have by and through him, that's what we find in Ephesians chapter 1 through 3. We see the riches of Christ. We see who we are. We see what God has done for us, how we were once alienated, how we were once far off, and how he and his and His perfect will, uh, called us, drew us, adopted us, gave us new life, came to dwell, the Holy Spirit came to dwell within us, sealing us onto the day of redemption, as I prayed earlier, strengthening us. We see all that in the first three chapters. But when we start looking at chapters four, we see then of living out those riches, living out those truths, all that we are in Christ, all that God is, all that we are in Christ, all that we have by and through him, we see how we're to live out those blessings, live out those riches, uh, beginning in chapter 4. And we saw in chapter 4 where we are to uh, walk worthy of our calling. That's the first thing we, we looked at. We're to walk worthy of our calling. When we're sitting here today... I think we need to at least go back to verses 8 and 9. And so we'll look at that from, from uh, the English Standard Version, if we, if we can have that, Eric. If it's working. If it's working. And if it's not working, we'll still look at it. We just won't use the, the, the PowerPoint. Okay, let's look at, at it from your, from your Bible. It'd be good to use our Bibles, right? Uh, so Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. There we go. In the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. All right. This takes me back more, though. Because in the New King James, it says, for you once were, you, you once were darkness. All right. There's a few once, the word once used a few times, more than once, pun intended, in the, it, leading up to this point. If you just take your, your Bibles there and, and turn back, look at verses 2 and 3 of Ephesians 2. Remember, in verse 1 it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Is there enough light up here, guys, for you to see? You guys, your eyes are young, though. How about you order guys? Can, can you see that okay? Okay. See it all right? All right. Pam's okay. All right, so verse, whoa. Let, let, let's leave it alone. Okay. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once, we once. So for it says, for at one time, we need to remember, at one time, 
we were not with God. We were not walking with God. We were alienated from God. We weren't walking in truth. We were walking foolishly and not wisely. Uh, one time we were. And one time, and look at verse 3, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. One time, that's where we were at. Look at verse 11. Because uh, five times here in, in chapter 2, he speaks of this matter of once or at one time. Uh, therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh. We were once unbelievers is what he's saying. And then in verse 13, but now in Christ, you who once were far off. How many see in that? So one time that was the condition. And remember I told you last week, there, there needs to be a time when you took off the old man and you put on the new. There was a time when you became a new person in Christ. So Paul was just reminding them here in, in this slide of, or in these verses 8 and 9, for you once, for at one time you were darkness. What does that mean? You, weren't, you didn't have the light of Christ. And if you don't have the light of Christ, you can't walk in his light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. But if you don't have Christ, you don't have light. You may have illumination of various things, but you don't have the light of Christ within you. You, once, you were at one time, uh, for at one time you were darkness, but now you're light. How? What does it say? In the Lord. Walk as children of light. That's a responsibility. I was thinking the, the roles and the responsibilities that we have as Christians. And, and we have that responsibility to walk in light. We are light as followers of Christ. And we have a role to live out. And that is to be light. Let your light so shine before men. Last, week's, or last month's memory verse. They may see your good works glorify your Father which is in heaven. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and righteous and true. Uh, we see that again from the from the New King James for you once for you were once darkness but now you're light in the Lord walk as children of light for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And so um, this is moral excellence, this is walking in integrity and dealing with our God or in our dealings with God and men, truth meaning honesty and equity and and uh, all this combined. We have the light of Christ. We have a light-filled life shining for his glory. We're not living in the darkness anymore. We're living in the light. And so because of that, and we could walk back or go back a little further and says, uh, as we tie this matter of see then, we could take it back to that we're called to be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as we see in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5. But the big deal today, the main focus is today, is really, okay, as a child of God, as an imitator of God who's called to walk in love, called to walk worthy, we need to see how to do that. And we do that by walking carefully and walking wisely. So if we can have those verses that we started with in the ESV form, please, let's look at this. Look carefully. Be careful. Be careful, right? Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Let's look at the first part of that. Look carefully then how you walk. Again, New King James says circumspectly, which really means correctly, accurately, consistency. It means precisely with great care. It means to live morally and to live wisely. In Psalms 14 and Psalms 53, it says, The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Uh, that fool could be intellectually sharp as far as the things of this world, but in God's eyes, the fool is the one who does not believe in God. The fool is the one who says there is no God. That's the fool. And so biblically, a fool is someone who ha is a person of unbelief, and because of that, they live in error and they live in disobedience to God. He lives apart from God and apart from God's word. That's what he says when it says, look carefully then how you walk. We are to walk correctly, 
according to God's word, accurately according to God's word. We're to walk consistently. Can we do that? Yeah, we can do that. We're called to do that, and God never calls us to do something that he hasn't equipped us to be able to do that. How many understand that? Go back to Ephesians 3, verse 16. And just remembering, Paul, this is a prayer of Paul's, and he says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. He strengthens us. He equips us. Look back a little bit further. Paul's prayer in chapter 1. He says in verse 17, this is a prayer of Paul in chapter 1, verse 17, for the church of Ephesus, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. That's a prayer that Paul was praying. Different people telling me yesterday, praying for you, Pastor. One person in particular sent me scriptures that lined right up with with the prayer they were praying and the need of the prayer, and I'm so grateful for those prayers. And so Paul is praying for the church, and he's praying that they would walk in wisdom. He's praying that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. So we have what we need. We need to utilize what God has given to us. There's no excuse for a, for a Christian to walk unwisely in this world. There's no excuse, and I'll use the word ignorance properly now, there's no excuse for you and I to be ignorant of the things of God as a Christian. We are called to walk wisely. We are called to, to be careful. Look carefully then how you walk. And of course the word walk means the way we conduct our everyday lives. How many of you have even given this a thought this past week? I need to be careful how I walk. And not just careful so I'm not involved in an accident or I trip over something, but, but that I am conducting my life in a way that brings glory and honor to God, in a way that builds up and encourages others. That's walking carefully. That's walking accurately. That's walking consistency or consistently, and that's walking with integrity. That's what we're called to do. Now, there's another thing here uh, that we need to take notice of. So we're to be, we're called to be uh, not as wives. A couple positive and negative. Look carefully then how you walk. He's given a direction. How we're not to walk unwise, but as wise. And then the second thing is making the best use of the time. I've said this before to people. And they've sort of looked at me blankly sometimes. But the, the, the most precious commodity I have is my time. And I want to make the most of it. I want it to count. There is nothing that bothers me more when I feel like, and I said the word feel, and I have to think back and look back. Did you pray about this, Scott? Did you commit your ways to the Lord? Did you trust also Him? And know that he's directing your path. Run those things through my head and not go off of my feelings. I mean, understand that. But I I don't want to waste time. I don't want my day at the end of the day. Boy, that was a waste. And God doesn't want us to waste either. Don't get me wrong. There needs to be time for repose. There needs to be time for rest. There needs to be time for rejuvenation. There needs to be time for for recreation. We, We need to take time. To, to just recharge, if you will. But all the other times, we're to be doing things wholeheartedly as on to the Lord. And we are to make the best of every opportunity that is granted to us. And really, that's how I'm seeing this matter. Redeeming the time, that's what the... Uh, King James says, New King James says, uh, making the best use of time, redeeming the time. That means to buy up, to ransom. It means to rescue from loss. I've got this segment of time. How can I redeem this time? How can I buy up this time and put it to best use? Here's an opportunity. How can I make the best of this opportunity? How can I make this time count for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God? How can I make the best use of this time? I jotted this little thought down yesterday. 
The days are evil. Okay, so distractions and temptations abound, don't they? Distractions and temptations abound. I, I'm just, I can only see life through my own two little eyes, okay, and my own experience. And, and, uh, and so as I read God's word and God tells me to make the best use of my time, to redeem the time and, and the days are evil, my, my uh, observation and my assessment of that is, yeah, there's, there's plenty of distractions, things that want to take me away from making good use of my time. Not only are there distractions, but there's also temptations, things that tempt me to not make good use of my time. And not to live for the glory of God. Distractions and temptations abound. They can take our focus off of Christ from living in the power of the Holy Spirit, from seeking the will of God, and living for His glory. That's what distractions and temptation can do. Uh, we are called to be diligent and to not only beware of the deadly duo, distractions and temptations, that lure us away, but we are called to fight against them. We, we need to understand they're going to happen. Just like temptations pop in our head, distractions are going to come. And I really believe that what is wise is in verse 10 of chapter 6 where Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The schemes of the devil, I believe, can come through distractions and temptations. So I need to be wise of that. Scott, they're going to come. Be ready for them. When they come, what are you going to do with them? I'm going to hold them against the word of God. What does God's word say about this? That, that's the testing and the proving and the trying. And that's what we're called to do. Making the best use of time because the days are evil. And, and so we need to understand that we are to take the opportunities that are given us. We need to be praying for uh, God. Okay, you're the great conductor of life. You're the one who orchestrates my circumstances. As I am living my life uh, surrendered, submitted to you, as I am praying, uh, as the psalmist prayed, uh, uh, to trust in the Lord with all my heart and not to lean on my own understandings, uh, to in all my ways acknowledge you and trust you to direct my path. Whether we look at that from, from Psalm 37 or Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, David believed with all his heart from Psalm 23 that he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So if we're living with that mindset and we're committing our ways over to the Lord, that's from Psalm 37, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him. If we're doing that, we have to trust, we have to have faith and trust that the, the, that the things we find ourselves in, I'm not talking about living in sin and then dealing with the consequence. I'm talking about a life committed, surrendered over to the Lord, praying for direction day by day. Okay, and this is the circumstance. Here's the situation we're in. Make the best time of that. I was rem reminded of, uh, of Mordecai uh, coming to Esther and telling her to pray and do this because perhaps... Perhaps, Esther, uh, God has brought you to this place for such a time as this. And so we, we really, I think, Esther chapter 4, I, I think we really, I believe we really need to seize the day, if you will, and, and to make the most of the moment in, in everything. Okay, I'm in this situation, God, so help me to redeem the time. Help me to make the best use of this. We live in days of evil, do we not? I mean, every day, evil abounds. And so we need to make the best use of that. All right, I think I beat that horse enough. And so what, what is the next thing that we see here in this passage? Well, we see in verse 17, which is similar to what we've already read, but let's look at that, uh, if we will. There we go. Therefore, there's another therefore. Lots of therefores and, where, and I think one wherefore in this, in this letter that Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus. And he says, therefore, so again, you link the layer for, and we're not going to keep linking, you get it by now, and we're to be walking, we're to be imitators of God, we're to walk in the light, we're to, or walk in love, we're to walk in light, uh, we're to make best use of our time, and then verse 
17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now let's think about this a little bit. In Colossians 4, 5, it's not going to be on the screen, but it says walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. So we're to walk in wisdom. And, and so he's saying here, therefore do not be unwise. Do not be unwise. But understand what the will of the Lord is. Well, how can I understand what the will of the Lord is? By the word of God. Not by a crazy eight ball. Not by throwing a couple options in a hat and draw one out. Not by going on your feelings. But what does the word of God say? What does the word of God say? Every time we're faced with a situation, but what does the word of God say? I I don't know how to walk in wisdom outside of looking to God's word. And that's the blessed life. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But, he, but his delight is in the, word, or in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate both day and night. Not word perfect, but from Psalms 1. We are called to not be unwise. We looked at various verses last week, and I'm not taking the time other than this. Verse 29 of chapter 4 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, it may impart grace to the hearers. It also tells us this. Verse 4 of chapter 5, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Why do I mention all these things? Well, we're not to be unwise. We're not to be unwise in our thinking. We're not to be unwise in our speaking. We're not to be unwise in our acting. If we're unwise in our speaking or in our thinking, good chance we're going to be unwise in our speaking and in our acting, right? Doesn't that make sense? If we're unwise in our thinking, in our meditating, in what's being mauled around and mused over in this head of ours, if it's, if, it's, if it's not wise, if it's not pure, if it's not holy, if it's not good, it's going to come out in our words and our actions. And we're called to, to not be unwise. Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. But instead, understand what the will of the Lord is. I can understand what the will of the Lord is by looking to the word of God. That is, to be be not unwise, that is so foolish as to not understand what the will of the Lord is. I suppose a lot of books have been written knowing the will of God, knowing the will of God. The greatest book written on knowing the will of God is called the Holy Bible. The word of God reveals the will of God. Look at verse 10 of Ephesians 5, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. We're called to do that. We're called to find out what is acceptable to the Lord. What are some of your ambitions right now, some of your desires right now, some of your goals right now in life? How do they line up with the Word of God? It's a challenge, isn't it? Is it acceptable to God? Verse 10, again, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Is this acceptable? How how can God bless plans when when they fly contrary to what Scripture says? How many get that? We're asking God to bless a mess, and He's not going to do that. We're asking God to bless sin. He's not going to do that. He's not going to do that. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Another good way of Romans 12, 2 is another good passage that's similar to that. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We talked about the renewing of the mind last week. We're called to live with a renewed mind. We're called to be seeking God's word. It is by the renewing of our mind with the word of God that we can prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God, Romans 12, 2. So we're called to that. So really, when we look at verse 10, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, 
this goes with these verses, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Uh, let me ask, make application here, and I don't want to see a show of hands, but I at least want to provoke thought. Get people to think a little bit. Does the will of God matter to you? Does the will of God matter? When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, I'll take us back to the Sermon on the Mount for just a moment. When you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. What is it, church? Your will be done. We are to desire the will of God. We want his will to be done. And so that means a submission of our will to his. And that's wherein lies the problem. A lot of people don't want to surrender their will over to God. They don't want to live for His glory. The big idea to them is not living in the presence of God, not living before God for the kingdom of God and for the glory of God. But yet that's what you and I are called to do as Christians. We're to find out what is acceptable to the Lord. To put every thought, every word, every action to the test. Uh, every one of us probably has some form of a plan this afternoon, if, even if it's nothing more than going home, eating, and going and taking a nap. Maybe that's not your plan. But all of us have plans. And so wh those plans, are they acceptable to you, God? And God, are my plans... Have I taken my plans and asked you to reveal, are they pleasing to you? Do my plans have the glory of God, the kingdom of God in mind? We need to ask ourselves that of, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. Well, I've spent enough time on that and we need to move on to the next verse. And that is where it says, and do not be drunk. And let me read it from the ESV since that's what's up there. And do not be drunk with wine. No, that's not. In which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. This was written 60, 63 A.D. Uh, they were faced with the worship of the mythological gods. Bacchus is what the Romans called them, the god of wine and the god of fertility. And so it was nothing for the church of Ephesus, it was nothing for the people in that day to worship this false deity with drunkenness and sexual immorality. That's what they did. The drunker and the more obscene the lewdness and the sexual behavior, the greater the God was worshipped in their thinking. And, and so that's context, if you will, for why Paul would say this to them. Don't be drunk. Remember, you took off the old man. Remember, you're a new creation in Christ. Remember, you used to, but you don't know more. Remember, you have put on righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. And you are called not to live as the non-believers live. So quit getting drunk. Quit, being, uh, quit living in sin. We, we talked about the sexual immorality and all those things mentioned in chapter 5 previously, in chapter 5 last week. Instead of being under the influence of alcohol, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit control you, not drink. That's what he's calling them to do. That's why he says, be, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't do this. That's what the unbelievers do. That's what the heathen does. That's what you may have used to have done. But don't do that anymore. In your B.C. years, you did that. But you have been washed. But you have been cleansed, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 6. 
Don't do that anymore. You might be thinking, well, Pastor, now you're putting do's and don'ts on me. The Bible has do's and don'ts. And it's not the doing and don't doing that saves us. It's not the, the sins of commission or the sins of omission. It's not failing to sin that saves us. We are saved by grace through faith. That's what Paul tells us in Ephesians 2. We talked about that. But if we have been born of God, then we're called and commanded not to live like we used to. You can argue, but the scripture is very clear. Do not be drunk, but be filled with the Spirit. You and I are born from above by the Holy Spirit of God. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're baptized into God's family by the Spirit of God. That is an act that God does, that God the Spirit does. Now it's your responsibility and I to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We see in verse 30 of chapter 4, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We grieve Him when we fail to live in accordance to God's Word. When we do the don'ts, and we don't do the do's. How many understand that one? That grieves the Holy Spirit of God. We're not to grieve the Holy Spirit. We're not to quench the Holy Spirit. But we are to be controlled by Him, verse 18 that we're looking at. And we're to walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5, 19. That's a responsibility you and I have. Now let me say this. You cannot be filled with the Spirit if you've not been born by the Spirit. And there again, where people are trying to clean up their own act, look prim and proper, do the right thing, and yet never have experienced being born from above. That takes place first, or you'll never be filled with the Spirit. So, when we by faith respond to Christ, or to the gracious call, by repentance and by faith, the Spirit of God already working, bringing that new life, quickening us from being dead in our sins, indwelling, sealing. Ah, now we're in a place where we can live a Spirit-filled life. And so we keep coming to God, and we remain in Christ. We abide in Him, and we remain faithful and obedient to His Word. And we do what we're supposed to do, and we don't do what we aren't supposed to do, and we repent when we do do what we're not supposed to, we're getting this, right? And as we repent, and as we cry out in desire, more than anything else, the Spirit to fill, the Spirit to fill, He does. He does. We're commanded. We're not commanded to be born of the Spirit. We're not commanded to be indwelt by the Spirit. We're not commanded to be or sealed by the Spirit. All those things are a work of God, but we are called to be filled by the Holy Spirit. To be filled and filled and filled and filled. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to ask yourself, have I been born of the Spirit? And if I have, then why, why am I in such a wretched state? Have I grieved Him? Have I quenched him? True communion with God. That's what he's calling us to here. All right, we need to move on. Next verse, Eric. One of the ways I believe that we keep the Spirit of God uh, a fresh filling, a, a fresh um, empowerment, enablement, uh, we find here in verse 19, because it follows verse 18, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And here's what the Spirit-filled Christian will be doing. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, we were a little hindered today by not having the words up on the screen, weren't we? I mean, yeah, it, it was. But man, man, I, I want to, 
I want to sing with them. I, I don't know what, I, I know the first verse of the doxology, of most people do, but the second and the third, or how many are there even? Three. I'm, I'm, I'm just stumbling and just trying to catch up with them. It's a blessing to be able to sing together, isn't it? It's a blessing to be able to worship together. That's what, what the writer of Hebrews, do not forsake the assembly of yourselves together because there's meaning in that. That's what we see the early church doing. The apostles draw doctrine and coming together and breaking bread and fellowship. We see that in Acts 2. This is the means of edifying. This is the means of encouraging. How much building up and encouraging we do when we're around each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's say outside the church building. What are we speaking to one another about? We say, and pastor, all we can do when we're outside the church building is just to be speaking in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I'm saying that's what we're to do when we come together and what we need to be doing when we're not inside this church building because we are a temple of the Holy Spirit ourselves is to be saying things and doing things that build each other up, not tear each other down. Because when we're saying and doing things that tear each other down, that quenches the Spirit. That grieves the Holy Spirit of God. And that puts us in a place where we won't be filled with the Holy Spirit. So really, it's under the influence of the Spirit. When we, when we come together, we, we will sing. Now, when we look at the list of songs here, to, to sing uh, psalms uh, right from the psalm book, Psalm 150 psalms, singing the psalms and hymns, which are songs of praise and spiritual songs, which express our, our spiritual affection to God, uh, and uh, singing and making melody. Or melody. So our, our lips sing. We hear each other. Sometimes you might not want to hear the guy beside you or he, not you. What does God hear? God hears what's going on inside the heart. That's what he hears. Is your singing to God pleasing to God? You can have the worst voice. You could be one of those guys that can't carry a tune in a bucket, right? And yet your praise be such a blessing to God because it comes from a heart that's been transformed and just longs to give him glory and honor. This is, a, this is one of the great ways of, 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 of just um, praising our Lord when we're doing it filled with the Spirit of God, when it's spiritual, when it is as Jesus said in John 4, uh, those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. All right, well, well we're going to have to close this. Uh, next, next passage, Eric. Here's the other thing that we're called to do. Not only are we to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spirits, this is how we walk carefully, this is how we walk in wisdom, this is how we walk filled that continual filling taking place of the Holy Spirit. This is how we do it. Along with what these verses says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting one another or to one another in the fear of God. What do we see here? Well, we see true adoration. We, true, we see true uh, gratitude and appreciation, Right? And so just do a little inventory of your life, do uh, a little application here. How much giving of thanks do you do to God on a daily basis? We are to be people who live, uh, sorry the phrase, but a, a gratitude or an attitude of gratitude. We're called to that, but, but it should not be something, oh, I'm going to try to. No, it should just flow. Because if we're, if we're walking in the Spirit, if we're filled with the Spirit, if we're living in accordance to God's Word, if we're seeking to do His will, seeking to know His will, there's going to be gratitude in our hearts. We'll be, as it says in Hebrews, just continually giving that sacrifice of praise from our lips. We'll do it. That's what He desires. That's what's found pleasing to Him. Give him thanks always for all things. We see it different ways. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 
uh, starting with verse 16, rejoice always. How many of you have told me before you, you just can't learn a verse? I, I just can't remember scripture. Uh, how about trying this one on for size? First Thessalonians 5, 16, rejoice always. That, hey, that's a start, right? That's a goal. I'm going to learn scripture. Rejoice always. All right. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. See, it's building. Now it's up to three words. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Talking about the will of God? Well, it's God's will for you to rejoice. It's God's will for you to pray. It's God's will for you to give thanks. And so Paul is saying here, giving thanks always for all things. Sometimes things aren't easy to give thanks for, are they? How many of you have just been in a, and I said a hot mess here earlier today. How many of you have just been in almost, at least if not outside, externally, physically looking, inside you were a crumpled ball of a mess? And say, God, I, I, I'm really struggling to give you thanks for this one. We've been there, right? We've been there. Giving, a thank, or giving thanks in all things shows that we trust him. That we trust him. I don't, I don't understand this, God. My outer being, uh, no, my whole being, inner and outer, don't like this. But I thank you because you must obviously have purpose for this. And my purpose is for your glory and your honor. So God help me to give you thanks. And so giving thanks always for all things to, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's in him, it's by him, it's through him, right? We would have no connection. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so it's, it's, it is by him, it is through him, it is in him. And then we see this last verse, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And then as you go down through the rest of uh, chapter 5 and even chapter 6, we see the responsibilities of submission. We see it in the marriage, we see it in the family, we see it in the workplace, if you will. We see the whole matter of submission. And we so in verse 21, we have this, this uh, summary, if you will, this submission summary, submitting to one another in fear of God. Again, that's taking God by, by his word, that's trusting him by his word. It's living by faith and saying, I will live submitted to you, God, and I will show that by submitting to one another. It shows humility, and it, and it, it is a uh, means of nurturing unity within the church. It, being submitted, uh, seeing ourselves as equals. I like what Galatians 3.28 says, where it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. There are all those things. Truly, there are. But he says, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so we see each other as one. We're all just all members of the body of Christ in which he is head. And so we're called to be submitted to God and to one another. And that's an application too. Are you submitted to God? Have you come to that place where you, you, you've... You recognize him not only as your creator and your sustainer, but you recognize Christ as your Savior and you have surrendered, you have submitted yourself over to God and said, Spirit of God, I'm not in control anymore. Spirit of God, I want you to control me. I'm submitting myself to you, God. I will live in humility before you. I will live in humility uh, before my brothers and sisters. I will have the mind of Christ. I will esteem others ahead of myself. By your grace, God, I will do that. That's all part of this matter of walking, uh, of walking in wisdom, walking carefully, walking wisely. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for time together this morning. And I, I pray that uh, your words will have found their mark and that they, don't, that they will not end here, that you will continue to minister to our hearts, that these applications... Uh, closing with this matter of submission, but also just looking at the fact of 
of how we're called to to be imitators of God, how we're called to walk in love, how we're called to walk uh, worthy of our calling, how we're called to walk in light, and how we're called to walk carefully, wisely. Help us to do that for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, the name above.
we thank you for those truths that that song closed with, taken from your word, that neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Father, help us to build our lives our lives on the teaching of the apostles and Christ being the chief cornerstone. Build our lives upon you, God, upon your word, living in obedience to your word, living in obedience to your spirit, um, to walk carefully and to walk wisely, all for your glory, God. And we thank you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.